Okay, so we're taking a look at um, chapter 14 here now, and um, we're talking about the pretty much bond liability in here, although we'll talk a little bit about note payable as well. And uh, we had uh, left off at this slide last time where we were talking about how market rate of interest is determined for a bond, right? And it is really subject to the ratings of these bonds. And, um, you know, the less risky the bond, the higher the rating, right? And so the higher the rating, the lower the interest rate. So we're going to see what lower interest rates for companies that have uh, higher ratings. This is going to be lower interest. And we're going to expect what? higher interest for entities that are going to have a worse rating. No. In other words, if you have a better rating, right, you're more credit worthy. Okay? Like if you go to buy a house or something, they'll look at your credit rating. Let's say you have a credit rating of 780, you'll be able to get a lower interest rate, right? If you're rated and your credit rating is poor, you're rated lower, they're going to charge you a higher interest, right? Okay. These people down here are more risky. Look, junk rating, default or near default, do you want to pay them low interest to loan them money or do you want to pay them high interest? If I'm telling you there's a chance that you're going to invest in some money and you're going to lose your investment, then you have to be having a reward that's going to compensate you for the risk you're taking, right? So you would have to pay them higher interest, wouldn't you? Or you would expect higher interest from them if I'm putting the position of the investor. So when you borrow and you have a lousier rating, you're going to have to pay higher interest. If you're you know, a good rating, you're a good credit risk, then someone will loan you money and pay you lower interest, right? In fact, what entity pays the lowest interest? What's the lowest rate of interest that you can get on a bond investment? Basically a treasury bill, because that's backed by the full faith and credit of the federal government, right? So federal government has lower interest rates, although I did mention that they rated them down a little bit, although I think that was more of a political statement than it was financial uh, analysis, because as I said last time, I don't even know what happens if the federal government defaults on its debt. I mean, this would be unprecedented if that happened. So no one can tell you, well, that means this and that will happen. Nobody knows. It's kind of like, you know, someone trying to tell you what it's like when you die. Okay. Nobody knows what that's going to be like. because It's never happened before. Okay. So we're clear on that. Okay. Now this is not really, you know, terribly important for our purposes. What we're going to see when we look at these bonds is they're going to say that the market rate of interest, and they're just going to give it to us, but I'm telling you the market rate of interest would be based on how this what, how this entity is rated here, plus whatever's generally going on in the market, right? If market interest rates are going up, then obviously the market rates are going up, and if you're an entity that's what? That's, you know, up here, your premium on top of the regular market rate of interest is not going to be as quite as much. If you're an entity that's down here, you're going to have what? A larger gap between, you know, the general market rate of interest and what you're being charged. Okay? Okay. All right. So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at uh, how we're going to calculate the price of these bonds. And guys, it is very similar to what we looked at for investments before. It's just the mirror image now where we're putting a bond liability down instead of a bond, uh, a bond investment. Now, um, I can't remember if we use this terminology in Chapter 12, but just in case, uh, you know, forgot that we mentioned it or not, we need to know what it means when they tell us that a bond lists for 98. That means we would take what? We would take the thousand dollars face of the bond, multiply that times what? 0.98. And so the cash interest that's going to come out of this is going to be $980, right? So you got to calculate the cash if we say the bond issues at 98. Okay. If it says it issues at 101, then we would take the thousand dollars times what? 
1.01, that's going to equal $1,010, okay? Just to show you how that works, okay? So that's pretty easy if they give us the price of the bond. They say 101, whatever, that would actually be an easier question. The first bond issued at a discount, the second bond issued at a premium, didn't it? Okay. Now, there is a more mechanical process, of course, to calculate the amount of a bond price. And they tell us that we would have to take the present value of the cash flows that are going to be paid off of this bond. And so uh, you look at this example here, we've got this $700,000 bond and it pays interest, what, semi-annually, meaning there are how many interest payment dates? Two, right? We would take the 700,000, which is the principal, we'd multiply that by what? Should we use the market rate of interest or the stated rate of interest on the bond? Stated rate, good. Okay, these are 12% bonds, so we would take the point one, two, and then we would multiply that by what? One half, okay, just to show you the full mechanics here. I mean, they're just sort of jumping to the 6%. I like to just show you the whole thing here. This is how we're getting the 42,000. That's the interest, okay? Now, when we pay the person back on this bond, we're going to pay them the face on the bond, aren't we? Okay, so since it was a $700,000 bond, there's that 700,000. And then we have to go ahead and multiply that times the present value of the annuity factor. That's for my interest and present value of a dollar factor. That's for my principal. Same thing we did in the investment chapter, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look those factors up, we look them up at the market rate of interest. So what happens? Market rate of interest was 14%. So 14% what? divided by two will give me this 7%, right? And the what? We look up six periods. It was a three-year bond, and it was semi-annual, so that's six semi-annual periods, right? And where did they tell me three-year bond? Got to be in here somewhere. Mature in three years? So it's a three-year bond? Hello? Okay. Do you need me to look at the table with you? You want to look at the table? We can look at the table. If I can get out of this. If I get out of the show to look at the table. I'll keep those for now. So if you look at the what? At the present value table. And uh, let's first look up the factor that they used for the principal. And it was what? It was six periods, wasn't it? And the market rate was 14% divided by 2, so it was 7%. Was that the factor they used? Is that the same factor? Okay, we look back at the 0.6634, whatever. Different tables have different roundings, okay? And then what? Then we would go ahead and we would do it for the annuity. And so if we come over present value of the annuity for the interest, again, it's what? Six periods and the interest rate is the market rate, 7%. Is that the factor? 4.76654? Okay. Okay, so you can see where they got those. And then you take the present value of the principal plus the present value of the interest. And that is going to give me what price this bond should issue for. In this case, it's 666. Six three three. Okay. Now, when we issue that bond at that price six 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 three three, I ask you how much are we going to have to pay this person back? How much are we going to have to pay back the uh, the investor, uh, the principal part, huh? We got to pay him the full seven hundred thousand, right? So what's going to happen? Even though we're only borrowing this six 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 three three, we got to pay this person back the full seven hundred thousand. So our interest expense isn't going to be this fourteen thousand. It's going to be an amount that is more than fourteen thousand because we got to pay him back that extra, whatever it comes out to, forty something thousand dollars, don't we? At the end of this bond. 
Okay. Okay, so that's going to mean that when we calculate our interest, we know it's going to be something more than 42,000. It's going to be 42,000 plus what? Plus, you know, if we divided it evenly over the six period using a straight line, it'd be the discount divided by the six uh, semi-annual periods, right? Okay, so we go ahead and when we purchase the bond, we get this 666633 cash. We, of course, credit the bond payable for the base amount, and we have a discount now, don't we? Okay. So when we prepare our balance sheet, our balance sheet is going to show bond payable of how much? 700,000. Good. <laughs> And we're going to have a discount of 33,367. So that the what? The net carrying value of the bond is going to be exactly equal to the cash I got, which is 666633. And remember, we had the conversation, hey, what happens if I walk out? Or before I walk out, I say, forget about it. I would give you your money back, right? So we list the bond at its present value, which is exactly what I owe you right now, right? I'm borrowing the money from you? Okay, good. Now you come over, and uh, let's just go ahead and uh, take a look. We'll just do it on the next slide. We'll take a look. Guys, I'm not going to go through the investor. I'm going to pretty much ignore that. It's mirror image, and we already talked about it in chapter 12, right? Okay, but it is there for your review. It might not be a bad way to study for chapter 12 by also looking at the investor at the same time. Okay, but we're not going to spend time with that. We only want to do that uh, in the earlier chapter. Now, um, when we calculate the interest expense, it's going to be the outstanding balance times the effective rate of interest, which for the most part is going to be the market rate of interest. We're going to see that if there's bond issue costs, the effective rate could be different than the market rate. I'm not going to hold you accountable for figuring out what the effective rate is. The problems if we use an effective rate with bond issue costs, we'll give that to you. Okay, but uh, for now, you can think of effective rate as the market rate of interest. Okay, so we're going to multiply it times the outstanding balance times the market rate of interest. It was 14% divided by two and that gives me my effective interest here of four six six four now that's more than forty two thousand isn't it and it should be more than forty two thousand because what when the bond matures i have to pay the person the full seven hundred thousand meanwhile they only loaned me six 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 three three i'm really paying an extra thirty seven thousand seven three hundred and sixty seven dollars interest on this bond right so the interest expense is more than 42000 right? And the mathematics of finance helps us out here by having us multiply by the market rate of interest times the carrying value of the bond. That automatically will give us a higher amount, higher than the 42000 Question? At the end, we pay them 700 or $600? We pay them 700 We got to pay them back the full face. So we pay them more than what you like you Correct. And, and we pay more interest every every No, the interest, the fourteen thousand we'll pay them is based on whatever the stated rate was, which was that six percent, I guess, right? It was the six percent. So we're paying them forty two thousand, but when we pay them back, we pay them back the full seven hundred thousand, even though we only borrowed six 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 three three. Okay. That extra thirty three thousand we pay them back at the end. You can think of it this way: it catches them up at the end for all the time that my stupid bond was only paying 6% interest when the market was asking for 7, right? Okay. Okay. So we go ahead and we have this amortization uh, schedule here in which we're going to sit here and take the cash interest, which is the face amount. So let's just write that in. Why did they, oh, did they not get it? Why not just tell me the face amount? Why just say face amount? So it's what? 700,000 times the 6%, 700,000 is a face amount. That gives me what? 42,000. What's your best friend's name? 
42,000, right? You're, you guys tell your best friend, promise me you'll never change. Your best friend says, okay, I'll never change. 42,000 will not change for this bond because what? It's the same amount every period. It's based on the contract stated rate on the bond, right? Okay. Then what happens? To figure out the actual effective interest expense, I take the outstanding balance, which at the beginning was this 666633, and I multiply that by what? By the market rate of interest, which was, that was, from time, this, this question's a little confusing because they should have been a little more careful to remember to keep pointing out to us that it's 14% divided by two, right? So that gives us, the 7% semi-annual, that gives me interest expense of what? Oh, I see they wrote them right here. Hello, John. Why don't you just see where they wrote it there for us? Okay, so they put them right there, and you can see here that we have what? We have the interest expense is more than the cash interest that we're paying out, isn't it? Okay, now there's a difference between those two numbers, obviously. That difference is 4664. That's going to be the amount of discount amortization. So the difference between the cash interest and the amount of effective interest will give us the what? The amount of the discount amortization. Okay. Now, if you sit here and you look at the journal entry. Oh, they don't give me the journal entry. Let's just do the journal entry here. I'm going to debit interest expense for how much? Huh? I think I heard people saying it. it was everyone's. I think that was forty six, six six four, right? Okay, okay, good. And then I'm going to credit cash for how much? I'm going to credit the cash for the forty two thousand. Do I need a debit or a credit to make this journal entry balance? It's the easiest question I'm going to ask you all day. Do I need a credit or a debit to make this journal entry balance? I need a credit, and I need a credit of what? 4664. That credit goes to the discount, doesn't it? Right? Okay. Now, remember, we had written up here on the board. I'll just put it here in case somebody's watching this. I could see somebody sitting at 12 midnight with nothing to do on a Saturday night watching this video. We don't want them to feel like, you know, they're left out of the discussion. So originally we had done what? We had debited the discount for 33367. Right? With me so far? That was a pawn issue. That was a pawn issue, and then when we set it up on the balance sheet, it looked like this, right? Now what? Now, didn't we just credit the discount for what? 4664. Six, six, four. And so if you sit there and you do the math on that, 33367 minus what? 4. 664 for that credit gives me 28,703. Math check. Confirmation. Okay. 28,703, right? Okay. So if I sit there and I prepare my balance sheet now, sort of the way I did up here on the board, I would have how much is my bond payable? How much do we report bond payable at? 700,000, we show the face on that is 700,000. The discount is what? Is 28,703. And so now the carrying value of that bond is going to be 671. 297, which is that number right there. Okay, so the carrying value of the bond will go up by the amount of discount amortization. Why? 
the discount came down through the amortization. The discount is being subtracted from the bond. So if the discount amount comes down, carrying value has got to go up, right? And it goes up by the amount of the discount amortization, right? And so if you take a look at this uh, little calculation they made right here, you can see that uh, what? You simply add the amount of discount amortization to the previous carrying value and that gives you the new carrying value. I mean, you don't have to sit there and make a bunch of journal entries and post them and put together a set of financial statements to figure that out. I'm pointing that out to you because we've got a test on Monday and you don't want to be sitting there wasting time doing all this when all you have to do is take the amount of discount amortization, add it to the previous carrying value, that gives you the new carrying value, doesn't it? Right? Okay. Now when you come over and you go over into the next period now, that's the first six months, when you go over to the next period, notice you bring over that previous carrying value, you multiply that, multiply that by the market rate of interest and that gives you the interest for the next six months, doesn't it? Right? Okay. What's my buddy's name? That 42,000 isn't going to change, is it? Okay, so I would take the difference between the 42,000 and that, um, what is this? This is nonsense. How dare they come into my presentation and tell me to do anything? Okay, so what happens? You sit there and you go into the next period, you compare the what? The, the, uh, cash to the new interest expense, which is the new carrying amount times the market rate of interest for the next six months, that gives me what? That gives me the discount amortization for the next six months. I add that to the previous carrying value. That gives me the carrying value for the next six months, doesn't it? I bring that over. I multiply that times the market rate of interest. That gives me the interest expense for the next six months. The difference between that and 42000 is going to be the amortization discount. I'm not going to go through the whole table. You'll go into a coma here, right? Okay. Now, what happens? A couple things to observe, though. Notice, one, my 42000 said the same. You've already seen that. Notice that the carrying value is going up each period, isn't it? And it makes sense that it should be going up next period because what? It's getting closer to the day. Well, I will have to pay the full 700000 So it should go up, shouldn't it? Notice also that my interest expense is going up each period. And it should go up because after every six-month period, I owe a little bit more, don't I? Right? I borrowed that money for some time and I owe the uh, investor a little bit more. Okay, question? Okay, good. So we come over and uh, we basically would pay this off. There's a little bit of difference because of rounding. Question on that before we move on to this zero coupon bond, which we only have very little to say about that. No? Okay, good. Um, on your test, if I give you a question like this, and I'm asking you, say, what's the carrying value of the bond after the next uh, six months or something, I'll give you, here's what it was at the start of the six-month period, what would it be at the end of the six-month period? And if I give you any answers in which the carrying value stays the same or what goes down and it was a discount bond, can that possibly be the right answer? So you could always eliminate a couple of choices right there, right? If I were to give you a question like that, and then you'd be focusing on the ones where the carrying value does what? Carrying value's got to go up, right? Okay, good. Now you come over and uh, we talk about zero coupon bonds here. And the key thing here, and I'm not going to do anything but hold you accountable for the definition of a zero coupon bond, they do not state an interest rate. So there are no, it doesn't, shouldn't really say they pay no interest. They do not state an interest rate, so there's no semi-annual cash payments of interest coming out. That's what they mean, okay? Uh, what they'll do is they will simply issue the bond at a deep discount, and then the individual will pay back at face, and so the interest is actually the difference between what? 
the face, um, the amount that was issued for and what you ultimately pay them back. Okay, all right, that's all I want you to know about zero coupon bond. Let's take a look at now bonds sold at a premium. When bond sells for a premium, it sells for more than face. That's because the contract stated rate is now more than the market rate. Everybody wants my bond, don't they? Okay, now if you take a look here, um, they give us the same uh, bond. It's still that uh, it's still that 12% bond. Okay, but now what? Now the market rate, instead of being that 14, it's only what? It's only 10%. Okay, so my bond's going to issue a premium. Now again, what's your buddy's name? 42,000 won't change. The face on the bond is the same. The only thing we've changed in this fact pattern is what? the market rate of interest, and I don't think we need to go back to the table just to save us the hassle of going and looking that up. We would look up what? Now at, you want me to go to the table? I can do it, it's not that big of a deal, right? Somebody tell me how, what interest rate am I gonna look it up? Good, I'm gonna look at the what? 5% interest rate for the market, and it's gonna be six periods again because it's still a three-year bond, right? And I'd look it up for the principal, I'd look it up for the annuity, and for the interest payments, add those together, and this bond indeed does issue. Okay, and the 5% was right there. Okay, and I'm going to do what? I'm going to issue this bond for more than face, right? Okay, so now we go ahead and we see the entry at issuance and notice that we go ahead debit the cash obviously for the amount of cash we got we um, credit the bond payable for the face so the bond payable is going to stay at seven hundred thousand and then and putting back up on the board now what our little hunk of our balance sheet would look like and now we have a what premium and the premium is 35,533. Is that the right number? Okay. Now, do I subtract the premium or do I add it? Obviously, I add it. Every journal entry with a balance, you're right, has to have an add. So the carrying value. Of this bond is 735,533, right? Okay, and so if I'm sitting here and I'm now going to amortize the premium on this bond, any question on that? Premium adds to the carry value, right? Okay, now I come over and again we see the table here. Okay, now they don't give me the amounts like the other one did, but it's uh, very similar. It's going to be the face amount is how much? Oops, better get the pen for that. Face amount is 700, I don't know why it didn't go back to the red. 700,000 times the 0 0.06. That's where I get the 42,000, right? Okay, then I take the carrying amount, which was the what, 735,533, and that gives me the effective interest of 3677. Now, if I go ahead and I do that journal entry, what am I going to do? I'm going to go ahead and debit my interest expense. 36777. I'm going to credit cash, right? For 42,000, my buddy. Do I need a debit or a credit to make this journal entry balance? I need a debit to make it balance and that debit is going to go against the premium. Premium is 5 is gets debited for 5223. Okay. Now what's happening? If the premium had originally been credited for this um, 36, uh, what was it? 35, 35, 3, 
35. 533. I guess I could have seen it right there, right? Because it adds to the carrying amount. 35, 533. And I just debited it here for this 5223. Now the balance here is going to be what? 30,310. Notice I came up with that number very easily because the premium adds to the carrying amount, right? And if the bond payable is 700,000, just write it up here if I can. Bond payable is 700,000. And we say that the premium, just picking it up from here, is 30,310 then the carrying value of the bond is going to be 730,310, isn't it? Because it adds, okay? Now, um, what happens here? Notice that the carrying value is doing what? Is coming down each period, isn't it? And it should come down each period as I amortize that premium down, right? Okay. So what happens? When we're dealing with a premium, we're going to see that the carrying amount will come down each period because we're reducing the premium. The premium is adding to the carrying value. If we make the premium less, the carrying value is less, right? So all you have to do is take the premium amortization and do what? Subtract it from the previous carrying value. That gives you the new carrying value, right? Okay, now you come over and we bring that new carrying value over. We multiply that times the market rate of interest. That gives us the interest expense for the next six months. That difference will be the amount of premium amortization. You subtract that premium amortization from the previous carrying value. That gives you the new carrying value. You come over. I'm not going to go through the whole table, right? We'll go nuts here. Right? Okay. Now, another thing to observe here is what? The amount of interest expense comes down each period. And it should come down each period because I owe the person less money, don't I? And so since I owe them less, I'm going to have a lower amount of interest expense. How much am I going to pay them back? 700000 I'm going to get to keep that extra 35533 right? I don't have to give that back to them, and that extra 35533 is compensating me now for all the time that my bond was paying 12% when the market only wanted, what, 10% on that bond, 6%, 5% semi-annual. Okay, question? Okay, good. So you can see, guys... Uh, I don't know if this is real proportionate or not, okay? I don't know that they graphed every point on this, okay? But um, you can see that what? That uh, we are above face when we have a premium bond and we amortize down towards face. We are what? Below face when we have a discount bond and we amortize up towards face, right? Okay, question so far? It doesn't matter if the um, market value changes after we issue the bond? It depends on what uh, the intent is of the company associated with that bond, and we'll talk about using market rates later. But right now, assume that they intend to hold that bond to maturity, then you know we, we plan to pay it off through to maturity, then the market rate, what happens with it, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, okay? Um, again, if we were the uh, investor and it was held to maturity, same thing. If it's available for sale or um, trading, then we would mark it to market with unrealized holding gains and losses. And we're going to see that we've got a different approach for the creditors that we'll talk about. And I think we're going to talk about that after the midterm, and I'll explain to you what I'm talking about there and that um, there's information about convertible bonds that we can convert to stock and bonds with detachable stock purchase warrants that are at the back of this chapter. We're going to throw that into next time because I feel like we're getting a little too much too fast 
to be able to successfully take the exam on Monday. So we'll put the back half, those two more, a little more complicated things, the question you're asking, plus the um, detachable warrants and the convertible bonds, we'll put that on the next exam. Okay, so hold that thought. Okay? Okay, good. Now what happens if we issue the bonds between um, interest payment dates? Can that happen? Okay, or, or I've not, not issued the bonds between interest payment dates, and that can happen, and we'll talk about that. But what if we prepare the financial statements between interest payment dates? Well, then we're going to have to accrue interest at the year end, aren't we? Okay, so if you take a look, we have this what? We have this master where industries issued 700,000 of 12% bonds dated January 1st, Interest of 42000 is payable semi-annually, same bonds, right, on June 30th and December 31st. The bonds mature in three years. We have a market yield of 14%, so this is our discount bond, right? The entire bond issue was purchased. The fiscal year of Master Wares and United end on October 31st, and interest was last paid on June 30th. So if interest was last paid on June 30th, have I incurred any interest between June 30th and October 31st? Right? Interest is recognized with the passage of time, so I'm going to have to go ahead and accrue some interest on this. Okay? So if you take a look over here, all we have to do is take the interest expense that would have been for the full six months, the 46,911, and we multiply that times what? Times the 46,991. 46,991 came from, let's go back to the table for the discount. Okay, where did they get, oh, right here. Because it was what? It was uh, the interest for the full six months from June 30th to December 31st would have been what? Four, was it 46,991? I think I said 466, 46,991, right? But we have how many months? We have all of July, all of August, all of September, all of October. We only have four months, right? So they multiply that times the four sixth, and then the amount of discount amortization would have been this four nine nine one, but it's four sixths of the total six month period, right? And so we take both of those numbers now going to the uh, preparing the financial statement October thirty first scenario. And we multiply both of those times four six, don't we? And then the cash interest would have been forty two thousand. We multiply that times four six. So we just accrue for that period of time, don't we? Okay. Okay. Good. So we notice now, of course, instead of crediting cash, we're going to credit interest payable because the cash is going to be paid out until uh, what December thirty first, right? Okay. Now, when we get to December 31st, of course, we credit the cash for 42,000. We take interest expense for the remaining two months now. That's what? November, December, interest expense. We will liquidate the interest payable. We had set it up for 28,000 for the four months. Now we're just liquidating that, right? We're paying that off. So we debit the interest payable. We credit the discount for the remainder of the six month period, taking the total six month period discount and multiplying that now times the two six. And then we go ahead and we credit the cash, obviously, for the full 42,000. Right? Question? Okay, good. What's this? Oh, straight line. Straight line is for babies, isn't it? Okay. What they tell us is that GASB allow uh, not GASB, GASB is GASB is FASB's sister agency. So we have the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which sets standards for for uh, private and for um, uh, private entities like corporations and uh, non-public companies, okay? And then what? when we're in the public sector, we have state and local governments. The GASB sets accounting standards for them, and they're basically both in the same building. They're both 
financed by the Financial Accounting Foundation. So every now and then you'll hear me slip into GASB because I'm used to teaching my governmental accounting class. But uh, FASB tells us that we can use the effect, uh, we are supposed to use the effective interest method, but we can use straight line if it is not materially different from the effective interest method, which I often find annoying because it's like you have to first see what the difference was to determine if it's material or not. By the time you get done figuring out the difference, you might as well use the effective, but it could be for uh, our, you know, every six months or month to month reporting purposes, straight line might be a little easier, right? And they allow us to use that if it's not materially different. So now, instead of multiplying the market rate of interest times the carrying value of the bond, we simply do what? We simply take the total amount, was this the discount or the prince or the, the, yeah, this is the discount. We take the total amount of discount and we divide it by six and the amount of that six semi-annual periods, right? And the amount of discount amortization every six months here is going to be an even amount and we would simply credit the discount for the same amount every six months using straight line. Now, would I ask you the effective interest method? I mean, would I ask you, excuse me, the straight line? It's obviously easier, isn't it? Okay, but maybe I want to test to see if you know what to do with a discount once you amortize it. And I'll ask you, if I'm asking you straight line, I'm usually probably carrying on after that and asking you, what's the new carrying value of the bond? What do you do with a discount? Add it to the previous carrying value. Even under a straight line, it doesn't change, right? You add it to the previous carrying amount. So if I ask you a straight line question, most likely it's going to follow on and say, and what would the carrying value be after the first six months? And you're simply going to have to take that straight line uh, discount uh, amortization and add it to the previous carrying value to get the new carrying value, right? And if it's a premium, it's the opposite. Okay. Okay, good. And there you can see how the carrying value is going up, isn't it? And it goes up evenly by the amount of the discount amortization. And they don't show us something for the premium. Premium would be mirror image. Okay, all right, now we have something called debt issue costs, you could call them bond issue costs, whatever, they're sort of synonymous terms. What does, uh, what is this? Well, you can't go on a street corner and say, Psst, hey buddy, over here, wanna buy some bonds? You can't do that, right? If you're gonna issue bonds, you're gonna have to go through the appropriate procedures to bring those bonds to market, filings with the SEC, that sort of thing, right? Okay, all of those things are called bond issue costs. Now, if you have to pay bond issue costs when you issue a bond, is the, um, is the um, amount of cash you're gonna receive on that issuance less? I'm supposed to issue the bonds, $700,000 bonds, I'm supposed to issue them for $650,000. But they tell me I have to pay an underwriter ten thousand dollars to bring the market the bonds to market. How much cash am I going to get? Six hundred and forty thousand because I've got to pay that uh, underwriter, don't I? Okay, so it brings down the amount of cash that you receive on the issuance of the bond. So it in effect does what? It deepens the discount, doesn't it? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to report a line item called discount and bond issue cost. And that account will show the difference between what? The face of the bond discount and what? The, the, not the face of the bond, but the discount and any bond issue cost, right? Combined, okay? And then of course the cash that I'll receive will be uh, net of the face of the bond minus the discount, minus any bond issue cost, okay? So we come over and we take a look and we see that that's exactly what happened here and that we had what? We had before, remember the discount bond? We issued it for this 666633, 
But now notice what they do, the amount of cash we got is going to be subtracted, the 14,000 of these bonds slash uh, debt issue costs, whatever you want to call them, 14,000. So we got less cash, didn't we? Didn't we get less cash? The difference between the face and the cash that we got is now, it's the discount that we had before, but it's also now including what? The 14,000 of uh, bond issue cost. Okay. And notice the name of that account is now called that. The name of that account is now called discount and bond issue cost. Is both of them combined? And of course, we always credit the bond payable at the face amount. Question? Question? So we got less cash, didn't we? Do we still have to pay $42,000 interest every six months? Do we still have to pay back $700,000 at the end? So we're still paying the same interest and we're paying these bond issue costs too, aren't we? So if you borrow less money, we've gotten this 652 now instead of this 666-633, and you still pay the same interest, has your interest rate gone up or down? Good, your interest rate has gone up, hasn't it? Okay, and so instead of it being that 7%, the 14% divided by two, now my effective interest is more like 7.4389. Okay, now to get this exactly the way they have it here, we'd have to go through the present value formulas to come up with this 7.4389. But what I'm going to do is just sort of a very rough approximation to give you the idea of what it looks like because I'm not here to teach present value formulas. But just to give you a sense, I did a quick little calculation of that that I of course forgot to write down. Wonderful. Okay. So if you were to take what? If you were to take this 42,000. Well, you'd have to do it this way. You'd have to take the discount which was um why didn't I write it down? You'd have to take the discount, which originally was, well, no, I can take that whole discount. I can take this, what, six, well, that's after the first entry. This 47,367, I divide it by how many semi-annual periods? Six semi-annual periods, and when I do that, I get forty-seven thousand three six seven divided by what six gives me. I'm getting somewhere in the neighborhood of seven thousand eight hundred and ninety-four dollars, give or take. Is that what you're getting? Okay, so that's my what? That's my additional interest expense every six months, isn't it? I add that to what? To the 42,000, don't I? Because I also have to pay that every six months. Just showing you a way to roughly approximate that interest, that effective interest number they gave us. So that gives me somewhere in the neighborhood of 49,800. Nine four, give or take, because I don't feel like dealing with this fifty cents that I'm seeing here. Eight. Let's just make it eight nine four, whatever. With me so far, I divide that by the amount that I borrowed, which was what six five two six three three. Isn't that the amount that I actually ended up borrowing? And so if you divide that six five two. 633 is the actual cash I got. I'm showing a number of 7.6451, roughly, right? And so if you look back at that effective interest, okay, it's off and it's off because, guys, I did a very rough calculation. I took that discount and I simply divided it by six. 
that's not what they did. They went ahead and they used the present value formulas, which considers the difference in carrying value period to period, doesn't it? And so you're going to get a different number than the way I did it. I'm just trying to tell you that it's based on the idea that I, what, I borrowed less and I'm still paying the same amount of interest, right? I don't know. Wait for the wait for the finance class or go back to your finance class and ask them why they didn't teach you that. I don't care. There's a present value. Oh, with a table? With the present value table? Yeah. Um, you can't. No. The I'll, I, I, only thing I'll hold you account of, accountable for, to be honest with you, is for you to realize that the effective interest rate is what is used. So whatever I call out as the effective rate, I will expect you to know that that's what you use. And it would be different than the market rate. It's a little more than the market rate because we had to pay these bond issue costs, didn't we? There's probably some way to do it with the table, but the only way I've ever seen it done is with the formula, and I'm not getting into present value formulas in this class. It's not a math class. Okay, I want you to understand that once you know what the effective interest method is, uh, effective interest rate is, do you know what to do with it? And the answer is what? You multiply it times the carrying value of the debt, that gives you the interest expense, right? And now we're back to where we were a couple minutes ago. Okay. Question? I don't know why you guys are looking at me like the aliens just took over. We're good? Okay. Okay, the takeaway here is what? That the interest rate comes up if you receive less money on the borrowing, right? And you still have to pay that 42,000 plus the face back. Okay, all right. Now, uh, when we talk about long-term notes, okay? and the note is going to be debited for the uh, face amount, and we will debit the um, cash here that we received, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to have to pay the interest on this, and it's what, uh, interest semi-annually on a note, okay? So we take that 700,000 times the, um, Interest rate was, I guess, the same thing, what, 12%, uh, uh, I guess? 6% semi-annually, that's 42000 every six months. Okay, and then, of course, you have to pay back the note when it matures. Now, um, what we're looking at here is what happens if you were to issue a note in exchange for equipment, okay? And so we uh, purchased a packaging machine or whatever, and it was 12%, and it was 700,000 was the amount, and it was 12%, and it's a three-year note that requires interest to be paid semi-annually. The machine could have been purchased at a price of 666633. So you could run into this in business in which the person says what? Hey, if you pay me cash, I'll pay you less, right? Well, I'll charge you less for this thing. Now the difference between the amount that you could have paid if you had paid cash and the what? And the amount that you're going to have to pay in three years from now, that is going to be considered interest, isn't it? Okay, if you could have paid somebody 666633, they say, well, pay me 700,000 three years from now, that difference is interest, right? Okay, now we sit here and we give you the way to figure out the present value of the principal and interest and notice they uh, give us the factors here that'll give us this 666633, um, which is the present value of basically what we're borrowing here, the 700,000 plus the interest we're gonna have to pay. Now when we purchase the machine, we go ahead and we um, have the, they, they talk about this implicit interest rate, and the implicit interest rate is the rate that brought the um, amount that we're going to be paying for this machine to its present value. And the agreement may not call out the rate, okay? So the question becomes, where do you get the rate? And they tell us by imputing it, and they tell us 
that we would go ahead and get the rate that is implicit in the lease and we essentially will get that and they say externally in other words you would shop around and you would see what rates are being charged for similar type of transactions and that what ends up giving you the rate that then determines what the cash price would be versus the um, uh, the amount that they're charging the 700,000 versus what they could have bought it for for cash now if you come over and you take a look here they come up with what the machines present value is they went ahead and they came up with this implicit rate and they would have probably have to have backed in to this number by first getting the present value of the what they wanted for the machine and then figuring out the interest amount versus the uh, principal amount they get this 66633 and they go ahead and they debit the machinery for that price they credit the note payable for the full note payable and the difference is going to be now the discount so instead of debiting cash we're simply doing what debiting the equipment right okay so in a question if I were to tell you what is the um, well let's go and look at the next slide then I'll ask you that question notice that what we go ahead and we figure out the interest expense each period by taking the effective amount of the loan times the um, the effective rate times the outstanding balance which was what we've seen before it's that four six forty six six four four using the numbers we had before for the bonds you still have to what credit the cash for forty two thousand like we were before and the difference is going to be a credit to the discount on note payable okay now if the amount of the discount amortization is added to the interest expense if I sit here and I ask you what is the interest that's going to be paid on this bond it's going to be uh, paid for this piece of machinery if I ask you what the uh, price of the machine is it's the present value isn't it okay if I sit there and I ask you what is the interest that was paid on this it's going to be the 42 thousands plus this discount amount isn't it okay so I may give you a problem where they say they signed a note of 700,000 if they had bought the machine for cash it would have been 666633 you're gonna know that that difference is part of the interest expense isn't it and then you're gonna know that if it's seven percent I would have to tell you that that they're gonna have to pay 42,000 every period every six months whatever it is so if you add those 42,000 plus the amount of discount that's the total interest that got paid for this piece of machinery, right? Now, we're not getting into that here, but would you have to depreciate this machinery? Okay, so I could theoretically ask you uh, what's the depreciation on this as well, just so that you realize that what? Hey, they still would have to depreciate the machine, right? I'd tell you a straight line or whatever. Okay. Okay, good. And they go ahead and they show us the amortization schedule for the note, which we've already seen. It's no different than what we've seen before. It's the original amount times the interest rate, the market rate of interest, that difference versus the cash, and that's how we amortize that. Okay, now we talk about installment notes. Okay, and what we're going to see here now is as we make payments on this bond or whatever this note is we're going to have to do what we're going to have to sit here and we're going to have to separate the amount of payments between interest and principal reduction each period okay and as we get that principal reduction each period that is going to go uh, give us a lower carrying amount so that the next payment will be a separation between the principal and the interest right okay remember guys if you want to work on something else your best bet is not to come to class and since we're starting to have a little bit of an attendance issue um, I'm going to uh, I don't think I'm gonna allow anyone to take the test who missed the last uh, last this whole week of class so if you know somebody who's checked out of the class 
you need to tell them to come talk to me because I'm not going to allow them to take the test on Friday. I mean, on Monday. Okay, so I'm going to have to. I figure we're adults. I'm not making you take quizzes. I'm not making you turn in homework. The only expectation is you come to class, you pay attention, you participate, and then you go ahead and you take your exams. But if the issue is going to be, well, okay, I'm going to leverage off of that and I'm just going to check out a class, then you're not really doing the class at that point and you might as well drop it. Okay, so you come to class, you pay attention, that's all you got to do. And then you know go home, practice with the quizzes and stuff on your homework, practice with the practice the quiz that we're going to have, and you're in good shape for the class. But if you're going to, you know, sort of throw a wrench into that process and people are going to, I'm trying to talk in the choir now, people are going to stop coming to class or I'm going to work on a different project while I'm in class, then I'm going to just start, you know, treating it like a traditional class. Say, okay, bring your homework in. You got to turn in your homework. I'm going to have the GSI grade the homework and see what you did and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So let's try to avoid that. This summer session is too short for us to kind of play those games. Okay. All right, so we come over and we take a look and each payment that we make, some more, so much goes towards uh, interest, so much goes towards principal, okay? Now, um, we of course will have paid down the note entirely by the time we pay it off as we reduce that principal each period, okay? Now, if you look at this calculation here, what they do is that if you take the um, amount that you have uh, borrowed and you divide that by the present value of the annuity factor and uh, this one is present value of an annuity factor uh, is 4.76654 then your installment payment would be 139,857 and as you pay that so much will go towards principal so much will go towards interest each period now the way to look at this is to basically say that what that the you know what you've borrowed we'd have to tell you what you borrowed you can't deal with three unknowns but we could give you two unknowns in this question and this is how you would come up with them we sit here and we have this six 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 three three is what you borrow right and you know that six 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 three three is basically what? It's the present value factor times the payments, isn't it? Isn't an annuity a stream of payments? Isn't an annuity the stream of payments? Assuming this pen's gonna let me write the word payments here. Right? Okay, so we want to find the payments in this question, but we're going to have to come up with this present value factor. Now, they just gave it to us, didn't they? Okay. But they did tell us that it is a 12% note here. We have a what? We have a um, market rate of interest. And they'd have to give me the market rate here. would have to be what? 14%. Um, Okay, so they have to give me the market rate for me to get this. 14% is the market rate. They'd have to give that to me to do it the way I'm talking about. And then I would come over and look at the table that we've seen already. And I'm going to go to the present value of an ordinary annuity and I'm going to pick up the factor that corresponds to what? Six payments, and then I'm going to go along here until I find what? Until I find this factor at 7% here, okay? So now that I know what this factor is, now I can put in the factor. So the payments times the factor, which I'm not going to write it again, is 4.76654, 4 and I simply do what? I simply do the algebra here, and that gives me the payment, doesn't it? Okay. So we would have to know the market rate of interest on this to be able to do this uh, correctly so that we could have come over to the 7% column. 
um, they gave us this 12% note, but they would need to tell me uh, what the market rate of interest is as well to be able to do this. Now I come over and when I do that, let me get back in slideshow. Okay, when I come over now and I look at this, do I get back in slideshow or no? Okay, now when I come over now and I do this, what's going to happen? Each period, I'm going to go ahead and now I've figured out the payments, didn't I? I figured out the payments the way we just saw. And then each period, I'm going to go ahead and figure out what the interest is on that, which is the market rate of interest times the carrying of amount of the loan at the very beginning, right? That amount is going to be interest expense. Whatever's left is going to go against the principal, isn't it? So now I take that now lower carrying amount, and I take that, and I do what? I bring that, um, I have that lower carrying amount, I don't have to, I bring that over here, times the 7%, that's the interest for the next period, isn't it? Six months, whatever it is. I know that the payment's going to be the same because I just calculated what the payment should be, which the payment was what, whatever I had to uh, pay to, to, uh, to bring this to its present value. So I go ahead and I take that difference. That gives me now the amount that goes towards principal for the next six months, right? I subtract that off. That gives me this what? That gives me this 473. I bring it over, et cetera. So each payment, so much goes towards principal, so much goes towards interest. And of course, as the what? As the loan balance comes down, more goes towards principal, less goes towards interest. Why is it 7%? 7% is whatever the market rate of interest was on this. So even though they called it a 12% note, to be honest with you, I'm not even sure why they called out this 12%. I guess it could have a 12% note, but for some reason it was 14%. They didn't exactly tell us why they ended up with the 14%, but they'd have to tell you what the effective rate was for you to be able to do this. So. Where is written that it's not, that's, but it, we know that it is because they wrote this right here, 7%. I don't know what you want me to do. I guess I could write the editors and tell us you should have called out that the market is 14%. But when they're down here, it's 14%, right? Okay. And in order to get this factor, Okay, I can't get it using 6%. It, uh, it, it, for 6, I can't use it, get, it, get there using 6%. So I don't know if they have a typo here or what. I'm not sure why they said 12%. It's just very confusing. It is. I don't know why. I think they mean 14%, to be honest with you. Because we don't know if it's the market rate, the coupon, the... I mean, 12% here is nonsense. I, to be honest with you, I think this probably be a typo. It doesn't make any sense to me. That's a good question. Why would it be 12%? 12% is irrelevant. The payments are not 42000 or anything like that, right? The payments were based on whatever it was that was going to get us to this amount we're borrowing, right? Okay. I mean, this is the same way if you buy a house. It works the same way. Okay. Everybody who buys a house, although they amortize it over 30 years, monthly, but this is what they buy the house for, and then they take that and they would borrow so much, and then this would be the amount you borrowed. The amount you borrowed versus the, um, the times whatever the rate is on the loan is going to give you the amount that's interest each period, and the way they would get to the payment is by doing a calculation. They'd probably use a financial calculator to do that, you know, a computer program or something, but you could do it on the table the way I just talked about. It's easier for me to show you on the table and sit here and try to derive out of formulas. Uh, if I 
determine that you need to use a table for a question, I will give you the table. I haven't quite decided that yet, but yeah, you don't have to memorize the table. Okay, <laughs> I'll, uh, I will either give you the table. Uh, if you can figure it out using a financial calculator because you've already had that experience or something, that's fine. You could do that, but I'm not going to be testing how to use formula and financial calculators. No cheat sheet. You can have scratch paper, a calculator, the test, an eraser, a pencil, and a scantron. No cheat sheets. If somebody gave you a cheat sheet in accounting class, they cheated you. Accounting is not something that's tested with cheat sheets, guys. And I'm telling you that because when you get into the CPA exam, do they give you a cheat sheet? It's a closed book test. There's no looking anything up. And so I'm not going to sit here and put you in a position where you start you know, having to use cheat sheets and then you slowly let go of them. Question, guys? <laughs> what is a cheat sheet? Like sometimes, like let's say, I don't know, let's say we had uh, to increase an asset you debited to decrease your credit or something. And um, you know, let you come in with the thing that says that, but that's not how accounting works. So you know, you get a little bit of help. Okay, I asked the publishers about these typos, and they said to me, "Oh, okay, send them to us." And I'm like, "Okay, how much?" I mean, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, every time I find a typo, I've got to send it to them for what? So that they can fix the book for other people to use? You know, so uh, from time to time, I think we'll have that. There's no way that this 12% makes any sense. It should be a 14% note, or the market rate would have to be 14%, even though the note says uh, uh, 12, in order for us to sit here and do this. And at no time did they tell us there was a difference, right? between what the note said and what the, uh, and I don't know why 12% is relevant because we're figuring out the payments based on the present value of what this loan is. Okay, and so then we go ahead and uh, we debit the machinery, we credit the note payable, and then we go ahead and we uh, have the uh, for that would be for the pump, the person that's uh, lending the money. Okay, good. Um, then when we make the installment payments, notice what so much is principal and so much is interest, right? Okay. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And we have uh, Cali Industries purchase machinery from uh, Kefi Corporation. Where's this one? Because I made some notes on this one. Okay, from this Kefi Corporation uh, in payment for $432,000 purchase. They issued a one-year installment note to be paid in annual payments at the end of each month. The payment include an interest rate of 12%. Monthly installments are, so they want us to figure out the installments here. And notice, guys, that we're going to take, what, the $432,000 and divide it by this 11.25508, which came from the present value of the annuity table, right? And so we have what? Number of periods is 12. Interest rate is 1% because if it's an annual interest rate and we're trying to figure out monthly payments, then we're going to divide that 12% interest rate by the 12 months, right? So that gives us 1%, okay? So we come over. Let me get out a slideshow. I'm going over to the table. And I'm on the present value of the ordinary annuity table. And it was 
Um, how many periods? 12 periods, thank you, and it was what? 1%, and so I can find the factor right there, 11.52208. Is that that factor? Okay, and so I come back to the, um, the problem we were looking at, and again, the way I would set that up is I would say, well, I have 400, and I have this... Um, payments, which is the unknown here, times, and again, I would have had to look it up, 11.25508, right? Okay, and uh, so then I would go ahead and that has to be equal to this present value amount of 432,000. And so if you divide 432,000 by and that's what they're doing right here. I don't have to rewrite it. That's that right there, right? That gives me the payments. Uh huh. One percent came from the twelve percent, and they asked me for the monthly installments. Twelve months in a year divided by the twelve percent gives me one percent. One percent. Question. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, let's do this one, okay? Now this one, um, we have this is a v Ver Vernois company, purchased a machine from Chung Corporation on October 31st, 2018, in payment of, uh, in payment for the $576,000 purchase. Venus issued a one-year installment note to be paid in equal annual installments of 51176 Thank you, God. Here they just gave me the payment, right? They didn't make me look it up. Okay. And then they tell me at the end of each month, the payment include interest rate of 12%. Okay. And the amount of interest expense that we'll report in our income statement for the year ended December 31st, 2018. So they're going to ask me for the full year. I purchased this thing what? In October, so for the full year, I'm going to have the interest for November and December going on here, right? To be able to answer this. So we come over and uh, I can just put this in uh, slide. Well, let me just finish it right here. So we do what? For the first period, it's 1% times the 576, which is what uh, w the amount that we were purchasing the machine for. So for that first period, we have that much interest, don't we? Okay. Then what? Then for the second period, because the remainder of the payment, if we're paying fifty-one thousand, what is it? Fifty-one thousand one seven six is what we're paying, and we just did what? We just had five. 706 right there goes towards interest. That means then that there's 45,416 that will go against the principal, right? Right? So if we take that off the previous carrying value, that gives us the new carrying value, doesn't it? And we multiply that times 1% for December. There's our payment for December, right? I mean, that's the, not our payment, but that's the amount of interest that for our December payment. Right? And so you add those two together. Is that the interest expense? All right. Okay, so... Let's go ahead and let's take a quick break right now. And when we do, we will come back and we'll pick up here with, um, we're going to go to, we're going to skip the fair value. Uh, we could put some information about fair value disclosure here, but we're going to really go into making the payments in between interest payments, dates is the main thing I want to talk about now. And then we'll go to the quiz. Okay. All right, so let's take about uh, 10 minutes. We'll come back at 5 after.
chapter. Mm -hmm. So for chapter 12, mm -hmm. um, there are some concepts that you didn't go over in class, like the OTT. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and get started back. I want to um, see if we can at least start the quiz. Question? Yeah. Uh, if you are depreciating uh, while we are investing in the machine, so where does the depreciation go? Depreciation, ex yeah. debit depreciation, expense, credit accumulated depreciation. So would that uh, increase the full value of the machine? Absolutely. If I tell you that I debit depreciation expense and credit accumulated depreciation, that translated also translates that is synonymous for decreasing the book value of the asset, carrying value of the asset. We are not uh, considering the depreciation in the Are you talking about semi cash flows? What are you talking about? We're not. Uh, Hang on. Hang on a second. Back up. Okay. And it's just important to note that somewhere in the financial statements, either on the face, that means where the numbers are on the financial statements, or in the footnotes, we are going to have to disclose certain things such as interest rates, etc. Okay. So, uh, just a point that we disclose information like you know, things that you see here, call provisions, maturity dates, etc. And you can either do that in the footnotes or in the face of the financial statement. Just providing additional information. Oh wow, this is fancy. <laughs> okay, this is thing's scary. Okay, so what's happening? We're talking about the trade-off between return and risk, and we kind of talked about that when you're asking me the question earlier about you know why the interest rate is higher if the risk is more, right? Okay. Now, uh, when we're deciding how we're going to finance something, we're looking for financial leverage. And if a company earns a return on borrowed funds in excess of the cost of the borrowing, then we are said to uh, have leveraged that and shareholders are provided with a total return greater than what would have been earned with the equity funds alone, okay? So they go ahead and they give us financial statements and they're comparing Coke and Pepsi here and they give us the financial information and then they start looking at the debt to equity ratio. And notice in this example, Pepsi has more debt to equity than Coke does, right? And so they're a little bit riskier because who gets paid? They're a little bit more risky. Who gets paid first, the bondholders or the stockholders, if there's some sort of liquidation? Bondholders get paid first, right? So from the standpoint of the, uh, in the shareholders, the stockholders, this is more risky, isn't it? Okay. So you come over and you take a look and they look at the rate of return on assets. And it turns out that uh, Pepsi's getting a little lower return on assets. And it doesn't surprise me if they have, what, a higher debt-to-equity ratio that they would get a lower return on their assets because they have more liabilities doing the work here, don't they, in their assets? So they're getting a little lower return, plus they had a lower net income, probably because they had to pay more interest. But anyway, you come over and notice, though, that what? They are getting a higher return on their equity because they're using, they're leveraging those... Uh, that borrowing, right, so that they can get a better return. So this is good for them because even though they took more risk, they are getting a higher return for their greater risk, right? Okay. Okay. Um, and um, you can see here that, again, times interest earned. For um, Coke, you know, they have a higher times interest earned because they didn't borrow uh, as much. So that doesn't surprise me either that they'd have a higher times interest earned here. Okay. All right. I don't care about these disclosure questions. What needs to be disclosed? Um, you can look at those. That's fine. All of those things need to be disclosed based on that slide we had. Okay. Now um, let's talk about early extinguishment of debt. What happens here? 
let's say I decide to call this debt early. I sit there and I don't want to hold it out till maturity. Okay, If that's the case, I'm going to have to pay some sort of cash price to reti retire this debt. And if the cash I pay is more than the carrying value of the debt, then I'm going to suffer a loss on the retirement. If what? If the cash price is less than the carrying value of the debt, I'm going to experience a gain, right? Think about it. You tell your buddy, hey, let me borrow 50 bucks. You come back later and the buddy says, hey, just give me 48. Have you gained? You've gained, right? If what? Your buddy says, hey, you borrowed 50 bucks. Now you got to pay me 52. You're like, 52? You feel like a loser, don't you? You have to pay an extra two dollars okay so we're going to look at that see how we would compare the carrying value of the debt versus the redemption amount that difference is going to be the gain or loss okay so you take a look and they tell us that uh, call their seven hundred thousand dollar bonds and um, the call price was written into the indenture to be six hundred and eighty five thousand now remember we had said that the indenture would talk about things about what the call price was, et cetera. Okay. So since they told us that we had to pay $685,000 cash and the carrying amount of the debt was going to be what? Was going to be uh, six, what was it? Uh, the book value of the debt was 676. That's going to yield us a loss of what? Uh, 871000 because we had to pay 676 We had to pay more than the carrying value of the debt to retire it, didn't we? So just like if your buddy told you, hey, you know, you owe me 676288 and it makes you give you 685 to pay him off, you're a loser, aren't you? Hello? Okay, okay, good. You take a look at, um, and of course you'd have to liquidate the discount at that point as well. I don't know why they saved that one for the last part of the entry here. They could have put it all up at once. You would have to, of course, take the discount off. You take the bond payable off the books at face. You take the discount off, which the discount, of course, is the difference between the 700000 and the book value of the bond, 676288, right? Okay. Okay, good. Um, now, I am not going to get into convertible bonds where you convert the bonds into stock for this exam. So we're going to skip this today and we will come back after the exam and pick up this part of chapter 14. Okay, because this uh, gets a little bit, it's not hard, but it's a little involved. And at this point, I don't want to start having to teach you that today and then by Friday, Tomorrow we're sitting here, and I think I understand this, but I don't know, and then Monday we get a test on it. So we will come back to convertible bonds. We'll be coming back to bonds with detachable stock purchase ones. Okay. Okay, good. So let's just take a look at uh, this concept question, whatever. And uh, they tell us that we have $100,000, three years, 6% bonds. Um, um, on December 31st, and they've hundred they're issued them for 106,000. We're going to use straight line amortization, and on May 1st, 2020, 10,000 of the bonds were retired at 110. Okay, so um, we go ahead and we're going to see how they came up with this 467 loss, and uh, essentially what. We're going to have to first catch this bond, these bonds up before we do anything. So we would catch up the interest on these, which is to sit here and take the what? Take the interest expense up to date now, which is going to be the bond payable of six thousand times the one third times four twelfths times the ten percent interest rate on that. That gives us the amount of the. Uh, the uh, the amount that's going to go towards the bond payable. This is for the 10% uh, is because it's only 10,000. We set up the interest payable that we have to pay interest on and then we go ahead and we would uh, squeeze out for the interest expense here to balance this journal entry. 
And then to get to the book value of the bonds now, it's going to be the 1053, which is the 106,000 minus the amount that's maturing that we're calling. And that difference is going to be the loss because we had to pay what? We had to pay 110, the problem told us. We had to pay 110. So you take the 10,000 times the 110, that's where you get the 11,000. So since you took bonds off the books that had a carrying value that was less than what you paid for them, you have a loss. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at, and we'll do some of these fair value things after. What I want to do is take a look at bonds issued in between interest payment dates. Okay. What happens? Even though the bond may be dated January 1st, okay, we are going to be often issuing the bonds at a different date. So we may issue those bonds at April 1st. We may issue those bonds March 1st, whatever. And we're going to have to sit here and we're going to have to figure out what is the interest that has been accrued from the last interest payment date to the date that we're actually issuing the bonds. And we make the investors give us that cash up front, and then we will hold that cash until the next interest payment date comes. And so we'll set up an interest payable at the time that we issue the bonds. And then when we turn around and we actually pay, we will give them back whatever money they gave us when they bought the bond, plus any interest that they've actually earned now since that last interest payment date, okay? So often I'll be expecting you to say, well, what's the cash that should be issued, uh, should be uh, received at issuance? And the answer is going to be the amount of the issue price of the bond plus any accrued interest, okay? So let's just take a look at this example. And we have this, uh, $700,000, 12% bond, interest of 42,000 is payable semi-annually. And uh, the June 30th and December 31st, the, the bonds mature in three years. The market yield for the bonds is 14% and the entire bond issue was purchased, okay? Now what happens? They go ahead and they issue the bonds on um, January 1st, and we have interest payment dates of what? Our interest payment dates are June 30th and, where is it at? June 30th and December 31st, okay? So we go ahead and we look, and there's been what? Two months of interest. Where are they issuing these bonds? I have no idea where they're coming up with two months. Oh, here they are. Hello. So they say they were, I thought they said they issued on January 1st. They're dated that day, but they say they were unable to sell the bonds until what? March 1st. So two months have gone by since the last interest payment date, right? What are the interest payment dates? January 1st and... December 31st, right? So we should have had, not January 1st, but uh, June 30th and December 31st. So we should have had an interest payment date, what? December 31st, shouldn't we? But two months have gone by. So interest has accrued for January and February, okay? So what we do is we make the investor give us, what? the interest that has accrued for that two month period now, right? So up front, they hand me 14,000. So the amount of cash I get, they're assuming they issue these bonds at face, is going to be the cash, 700,000, the face value of the bond, plus what? Plus this 14,000? Okay. If you're waiting for deeper meaning, there is none yet. That's it. We make them give them the interest. Why do we do this? Why do we make the investors give me the two months interest that has accrued before they ever held the bond? When the six month period comes, when the next interest payment date comes, the company wants to write a check for what? 
42,000 to everyone. They don't want to sit here and say, well, okay, for you, it's going to be 40. For you, it's going to be 38,000. You got to change for a dollar because it could become an accounting nightmare if they have to cut different amounts of checks for all these different uh, investors who maybe bought these bonds on different days. So they go ahead and they make the investors do what? Give them the interest up front. And then when they pay the bond, they will just return that money to them, right? Okay. So if you take it when they pay the interest, I should say. So when you take a look, when they go ahead and this is the investor, I don't care about the investor. When they go ahead and they pay the interest, they pay 42,000, don't they? And then what? They pay back the 14,000, that's the accrued interest. And then interest expense is the 28,000, that's for the remaining period, that's for what? It was January, in February, I guess, that they gave me the interest for. And so what happens? They actually had interest expense for March, April, May, June, the four months, right? Okay. And that's where they get this 28000 It's going to be um, the four months worth of interest. Um, I guess it would be the 42000 times four twelfths then, right? Which is what they did here. 700000 times the 12%. Um, 12%? Oh, well, then they divided it by 12. Come on. 700,000 times what? 6% is so the way we were doing it before, right? For semi annual. Would give me the, um, and then I would multiply that die. But I would do it by 4 twelfths. Okay, so I would take the way I would do this 700,000 times what? Times. Oh, yeah, you would have to do 12% because that's the full year times what? times the, I like to do it, times four twelfths. You would use 12% because what? If it was half the year, you'd use one half, right? You'd use six twelfths, and since it's four twelfths of the year, you use four twelfths. Okay? Okay, good. Now you come over, and uh, I don't care about the investor here. Um, All we're going to do now is we're going to issue the bond at a discount. Okay, so we're issuing the bond at a discount. Remember this price, this 666, 633. Okay, but then we go ahead and if we don't get around to issuing them until March, same thing here, then we're still going to make the individuals give me what? People buying it, we're going to make them give me that 14,000 uh, 14, up front at the beginning. And so the only thing that's changed now is since it was a discounted price, you take the discounted price plus the 14000 that's the amount of cash that we get, whatever the issue price is. In the first case, it was just the face amount, 700000 right? Now it's just a discounted amount. Notice that the discount is the difference between the 700000 and the what? And the issue price of the 666-633, just like it was before. The amount of accrued interest here does not affect how we calculate the discount. It's exactly the same. Okay, and of course we set up the payable. And then when we go ahead and um, pay the interest a little bit later, then what? Then we have our interest expense, which of course is going to be at the market rate of interest, right? And then we're going to go ahead and uh, hit our interest payable difference is going to be, and notice it's four sixths of the full six month discount. So that four six six four would have been the full six month discount. Um, but uh, since it's only four six of the period, then we're going to go ahead. And so we're just taking those same numbers from that earlier amortization schedule, multiplying everything, everything times the four six now. Okay. Okay, again, I don't care about the investors. Even if no one purchased the We'd still amortize the um, the uh, discount at that point. You said it again? Yeah, there's four six here because we, 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 we amortize the discount on the during the first month. Even if we didn't issue the bond. Um, yes, because we still advertise a discount because 
time is still passing, right? And so those bonds are still going to pay off at face. So yeah, we'd still have to amortize the discount for those two periods. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's, uh, we'll come, we will do trouble debt restructuring also after um, on the next test. Okay. So let's go ahead. And I think that was sort of the last part of chapter 14. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at... A couple of questions from the, uh, as many as we can get in anyway. Okay, and let's just take a look at a couple of these. I think we we might get through all of them. We'll see how far we get. Okay. Uh huh. We're going to go over convertible bonds, bonds with detachable stock purchase warrants, uh, fair value um, calculations for bonds, and trouble debt restructuring after the test. So, yeah, those areas that we didn't cover in this chapter, essentially, we'll cover, in, that we didn't cover for this test, we'll cover for the uh, next one. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at um, a couple of these. And we have this uh, company. Um, what amount of accrued interest payable should be report? What did I do? Forget the question. Well, that won't help us much now, will it? So let's get to the second one, or I guess what I've la labeled out is the first one. So this Arbach Inc. issued 4% bonds on October, for, uh, October 1st, 2018. The bonds have a maturity date of September 30th, 2028, and a face amount of $300 million. The bonds pay interest March 31st and March 31st, beginning March 31st, 2019. The effective interest rate established by the bond was 6%. So Arbach issued the bond at what? 4% bond, and they have an effective interest rate of 6%. So what happens? The bond issues at a discount, right? Okay. Okay, number two. Uh, Hardy Corporation issued 10 million of its 8% bonds for 9.2 million. The bonds were priced to yield 10%. The bonds were dated, da da da, inches are payable semi annually. The effective interest method is used. By how much should the bond discount be reduced for the six months ended December 31st? So we know that we're going to have to do what? Amortize that discount, right? And we know that the amortization of the discount is going to be the difference between the cash interest and the effective interest, right? Okay. So if you go ahead and they give us the choices here, let's just take a look at uh, how they showed us that in the feedback section. We issued the bonds for $9.2 million. And uh, the, uh, just go back up to the fact pattern. We issued the bonds for what? Uh, for this, where they tell me how much they issued them for? Nine. Oh, hello. Here it is. Nine point two million. Thank you. Is what they issued them for. So we take the nine point two million and we use the what? 
market rate of interest, which excuse me, which is the 10% divided by two, right? Okay, so you take that 10% divided by two, gives me the 5% times the 9.2 million, that gives me the effective interest. The cash interest is going to be, it's the 8% divided by two times the face of the bond, right? Okay, so that difference of 60,000 is the amount that we will amortize the discount for, right? Okay, so we will do what? We'll sit here and we'll debit interest expense. We'll debit interest expense for the full what? Uh, 460. Okay, we'll credit the uh, cash for the 400,000 and we credit the discount, right? Okay, okay, good. Let's take a look at, stop me if there's a question, guys. I'm gonna roll here so that we can maybe get through a couple of these so we don't have as many to do tomorrow. Uh, January 1st issues a thousand of its thousand uh, dollar bonds, 8%, and we issue them at 98. Interest is payable semi-annually, January 1st, July 1st. The bonds mature on January 1st, and Solo paid 50000 in bond issue costs. And so we have to figure out our amount of interest expense, and we're going to use the straight line method on that, right? Now, we know right out of the gate that the bonds were issued for $1,000, each bond, how many bonds? How many bonds? Thousand bonds, so that's what, a million bucks? At face? Right? But then they issued them for how much? 98, the problem tells me. So that means they actually got $980,000 before they considered any bond issue costs, right? Guys, is there a question? We don't really have separate study sessions going while the lecture is going. Okay, and so what happens? We sit here and they had to pay these bond issue costs of 50000 didn't they? Okay, so we go ahead. Guys, is there a question? Okay, we don't have like separate discussions going while the class is going, right? Okay, so we've got what? We've got this 50000 bond issue cost that they had to pay. So that means that what? They really got $930,000 cash on this thing, didn't they? Okay. And so if you take the what? You take the million dollars that they got minus the what? 930 means there's a discount of 70,000. Okay. And so when we go ahead and we calculate our interest expense now, we're going to take what? We're going to take the million dollars times, and it's an 8% bond, and they're asking me what, for the entire amount of interest expense for the entire year? So I'm going to take this 0 0.08, and that's going to be what? 80,000, and then I'm going to have to go ahead and amortize this 70,000 and that's going to add to my interest expenses. I amortize that discount, right? And and bond issue costs. So when you go ahead and you do that, you get what? You get the interest expense including that amortization of 7,000. So the interest expense is 87,000. Okay? So the bond issue costs do what? They deepen the discount, don't they? And as you amortize that discount, it brings your interest expense up even more than it would have been had you not had the bond issue cost, right? Hello? I would have gotten 980 cash, right? If it weren't for the bond issue cost? Did the bond issue cost have to come off that cash? Can you explain again with the 
Yeah, it's the 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 bond issued at ninety eight, right? We paid the bond issue cost, so we got cash out of nine thirty, right? You take the face amount minus the cash we got, and we're saying that's the seventy thousand. I kind of scribbled it over there. Seventy thousand is the difference between the cash that we got and the face of the bond, right? And we're just going to combine that. If there was no bond issue cost, the discount would have been what twenty thousand here. But because of these bond issue costs, now we're saying that the total discount plus bond issue cost is seventy thousand, right? Okay, we divide that by, and um, they tell us that it is somewhere. They must have told us it's a. Oh well, we had to figure out. I guess that it's a ten-year bond, twenty eighteen to twenty twenty-eight. It's a ten-year bond, and so they divided that by the ten years, and that gave us the seven thousand. Okay, so if you take the eighty thousand, which is the cash interest plus the amortization of now not just the discount. But the discount and the bond issue cost increases my interest expense. That's why that effective interest rate is going to be higher when we have bond issue cost than it would be if we didn't because we're paying a little more interest each period. Okay? Okay, good. Come over and uh, let's take a look. What do they say? That one's medium. I don't know how they come up with their rankings of this. To me, this one is easier than this one. They're both pretty easy though. When they say hard, the other one medium. I used to not put in there, I didn't want you guys to see whether it was hard or medium or what, because I didn't want you to start trying to back into something, you know. But I started decided to start leaving it in there so you can kind of see, you know, um, that you're um, able to answer these questions pretty easily actually. Oh, so using the same facts now, they want us to figure out what is the carrying value of the bonds reported December 31st, um, 2018. And since we amortized how much of the discount? Right, we had the carrying value of the bonds was what, one million? I mean, not the carrying amount, but the original amount was one, one million. And then we had this, what? We had this uh, discount of 70,000, right? So that got us to what, 930 was the carrying amount? And now what's happened? Now we are going to have to increase that by what, 7,000? So it should be, um, what did I do wrong? Oh, it was 980, sorry guys. Carrying amount was 980. Carrying amount is what? Is the uh, face of the bond, which was a million. Minus what? Just the discount amount of no nine eighty two. How do we get nine eighty two? What did I do wrong? When we issued the bond, it was nine seventy, right? And it should go up by the amount of discount amortization of 7,000. Huh? Well, let's see what they did here. That should help us to figure it out, I guess. Uh, 937, yeah. Okay. No wonder they're driving me nuts over here. Okay, so it's got to be what, 937? Which they don't have as a choice? I think they meant, I don't know what they're thinking here. It's a million dollars minus the discount when I first started, I don't know where I got 980, was 70,000. That gave me what, 930. Plus the what? Plus the seven thousand that's been amortized gives should give us nine thirty seven, right? I don't know what they're doing. They screwed up. Okay, when they show me the answer down here, they make it the nine thirty seven, right? Right here. 
and they said, can you please send us where, where the typos are? I'm like, how can I send you where the typos are when I'm having to discover them in front of my class? You know, I, you know, this is like, so I go after each class and say, here was how you screwed up my class today. I don't know what exactly it is they want me to put in those emails to them. So the current value becomes a dead Huh? The yeah, I've started to think maybe they meant just off, just based off the discount, but yeah, the carrying value, we, we include the discount and the bond issue cost in one account, okay? And so notice when we had issued the bonds, we debited discount and bond issue cost, the 70000 and that's shown as one line item on the financial report. So we have bond payable less discount and bond issue cost and that gives us the total carrying value and it's treated just like we had before when you amortize the premium and I started to do that till they screwed me up with those choices not matching whatever the um, the car previous carrying value was the 930 plus the amortization of the discount and bond issue cost is going to be the new carrying value okay all right good come over and let's take a look at number five and uh, we've got this Kramer company sold five year eight percent bond the face amount of the bond was a million uh, it was a hundred thousand while the issue price was 102 so we have what we have a premium right um, interest is payable on April 1st of each year the fiscal year of Kramer company ends on December 31st how much interest expense will we report for December 31st, 2018? And we're going to assume straight line amortization. So we have what? We issued the bonds October 1st. And they're asking me at what? December 31st. So how many months do we have here? Three months. Okay. That we're going to be dealing with. And so we're going to take this... Uh, Interest, which is on the bond of a hundred thousand, times what? Times the eight percent. Times how many months? Three months divided by twelve. That's going to give me what? Huh? Okay, I'll get myself. How much? Yeah. 2000 Okay. That's going to give me 2000 But then I also have to do what? Amortize that premium, don't I? Okay. So when I amortize the premium, I'm going to take 2000 And it's how many years? Five years? Okay. So the way I would do it, I like to do it by, since they're asking me after three months, I would do how many months in five years? 60 months. 2,000 divided by what? 60 months gives me, great, $33.33 per month times how many months? Times the three months is going to give me what um, another hundred dollars so why am I not getting the answer this time oh I'm that's right no I'm getting gonna get a B right because it's a premium amortization and since it's a premium amortization that actually reduces my interest below the cash interest right so the answer is 1900 here okay there it is okay Okay, why don't we stop there, and uh, there's about 15 questions in this file, so what we'll do is we'll complete this tomorrow, we'll go through the remaining nine or so questions that are here, and then uh, look tomorrow and you'll see another file, and I'll try to put somewhere in the range of, what are we going to have, how many questions do we see on the test? 25? So I'll put maybe 15 questions, multiple choice, and then we'll I'll also put a uh, free response question in the file, and that's what we'll do for the back half of the discussion tomorrow. We'll finish this, and then we're going to go through questions from chapter 12, 13, 14, multiple choice, 
and then one full-blown, uh, you know, what do they call it, free response question. And I don't know which chapter yet I'm going to pull that example of the free response. And I don't know which question, uh, which chapter I'm going to give you your actual free response from. But at least you'll get a sense to see the nature of the type of questions that will have as free response. All right? Okay, guys, I will see you tomorrow.